Howdy, you may not know me, but I'm old Sammy the Sloth, and I'm here to tell you that Benchmark and Seesaw has me so confused. I just can't get in it, and I don't understand it. So Miss Wilson, she decides she's just going to read this story to you aloud over the interweb. And so I want you just to listen to what she has to read to you. I think you really enjoy it. I know I sure do. Here's Miss Wilson. You are so right, Sammy. Today has been a challenge, and we have risen to the occasion. And there's more than one way to get the job done. So right now... Without further ado, I'd like to read to you The Red Tail Angels. Chapter One. The Tuskegee Army Airfield, Tuskegee, Alabama, April 1943. At two o'clock in the morning, the only sound coming from the barracks was the slow measured breathing of men in deep sleep. Only one was awake. Charlie held a flashlight over the book on his lap, but his gaze was set on the photograph tucked into the crease between the pages. From the picture, a handsome man in suit and tie stared back at him, a mischievous look in his eyes. This was his pop. Now gray and retired, his father had sent him off to Tuskegee two years ago with stern direction. Now, you show those men what it means to be a fighter, this is no small thing, the Army finally having us fly planes. Do me proud, but most of all, you come back alive, you understand? Charlie felt the weight of many people on his shoulders, but he had merely nodded and given Pop a quick hug. He ran to the bus waiting for him and refused to look back. He hadn't wanted his father to see the fear on his face the fear that was coursing through his whole body. Now as he sat in the darkness of the barracks, Charlie felt that, some, that same overwhelming dread. Tomorrow morning, the squadron was shipping out, and despite months of training filled with countless practice missions, Charlie wondered if he was really ready. A man heading into war was like a blind man walking along the edge of a cliff. Would he sense? and successfully respond to the dangers around him? Or would one misstep lead him to death? There's Charlie's picture of Charlie's dad. After he fell asleep, Charlie dreamt of his home back in Philly, his head filled with images of his old room at Penn and warm afternoons spent studying on the university lawn. A dedicated student and avid reader, Charlie was rarely seen without a book in his hands. And while this may have helped him graduate with honors and ace all of his written exams at the civilian pilot school, now it was also the cause of a lot of teasing by the other men in the barracks. On his first night on base, a hefty shadow had loomed over him as he sat reading on his cot. Hey, ace, came a thick drawl from above him. That book tell you how we gonna kill some Nazis? Cause really that's all we need to know. All those other words there are just wasting your time. Well, as a matter of fact, this book, Charlie had started to explain before the large man cut him off. Yeah, 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 why don't you just put the book down and come play some cards? He reached out his enormous hand to Charlie. The name's Antoine Douglas, but people call me Tex. Charlie had just assumed that Antoine was from Texas. He learned later on that Tex actually hailed from Louisiana and earned his name due to his size. Big as the state of Texas, Antoine had said with a deep bellowing laugh when he explained his nickname to Charlie. Does it make you think of Big Tex at the state fair? It does me. People often cowered in Texas' presence and he used this to his advantage. But thankfully for Charlie, Tex had taken a liking to him. He also introduced him to two other men who had become his closest friends, McCleary and Smith, whom everyone called Mac and Smitty. Something tells me they have nicknames in the barracks. Now at 0600 Sharp, the four men stood at attention with the rest of their squadron awaiting orders. 
Their tightly packed bags line the floor behind their feet. Suddenly, Colonel Lewis barged through the front door of the barracks and walked along the line of men, inspecting their appearance. All right, men, here's what's going to happen. In two hours, we'll get on the train for New York, and from there we'll board the Mariposa destination Africa. Our intelligence tells us that the Germans have come, have some double-A emplacements on an island a short flight away that could put our bombers in danger. We need to take them out. It's time to quit playing pretend and get into this thing. I think you all know the significance of this mission goes beyond our primary objective. You will be the first all-black air unit going into active combat. Let's show the world how ready we are. And just as abruptly as he has entered, the colonel turned and left. The men relaxed their stance and broke from the line. Ah, good old New York, my old hometown, Smitty started to sing, adding lyrics as he went. Too bad we won't have time to see the city. I could show you all my old hangouts. You mean like your parents' basement? Asked Tex. Very funny, big man. No, I'm talking about some high-class establishments. Good food and even better music. Things a roughneck like you wouldn't know anything about. To distract Tex from the insult, Matt quickly changed the subject. What I want to know is why they are sending us to Africa. It's darn hot there. Y'all can barely handle this Alabama heat. What do you think that Africa heat will do to you? Smitty, you'll be a sweaty mess. Charlie and Smitty laughed, but then gave each other a serious look, knowing he was right. Mac was used to the sticky southern weather from his days growing up on a farm in Georgia, but the long, hot days of Alabama summers had been torture for the rest of the men. Charlie couldn't help but wonder if the African heat might do them all in before the enemy even had a chance. The enemy, thought Charlie. Here in Alabama, the enemy almost seemed like a mythical creature, but once they were in Africa, everything that they had been training for would become a reality. Chapter 2, North Africa, May 1943. The base was different from what the men had become accustomed to back in Alabama, but was nothing less than what one would expect from a war encampment. Rows of canvas tents served as sleeping quarters and a makeshift kitchen was set up in one of the larger tents. But training took up so much of their time that they scarcely noticed the discomfort of their new surroundings. A different officer, Major Conrad, was assigned to prepare them for combat and he drilled them each day until they were bleary-eyed. Major Conrad's temper was infamous, and he'd been storming around the base all day, screaming out instructions to the pilots. No one was exempt from his berating. Berating like his argument or his yelling orders at them. Berating them. As Charlie was checking over his plane's machinery one day, he witnessed Major Conrad storming into the officer's tent. He knew he probably shouldn't eavesdrop, but he found himself edging closer and closer to the tent's opening. What is it going to take for your men to be ready for war, Colonel? The Major hollered, dramatically throwing his cap on the ground. Am I going to have to go up there with them and hold their hands? Colonel Lewis maintained his characteristic calm demeanor. With all due respect, Major, he said, emphasizing the man's rank, which was lower than his own. These men are some of the best pilots out there, and you know that as well as I do. How many men have you seen who can dive bomb like they can? Please tell me, because I'd like to see them for myself. Well, I know you think these men are special, sir, but the rest of us have yet to see it. They can fly fancy pants maneuvers all they want, but that won't mean anything when they come face to face with enemy planes that are locked and loaded and ready to shoot them right out of the clear blue sky. The major grabbed his cap and hastily placed it on his head as he started toward the tent's entrance. I'll give it to you that these men are good pilots, but it's my job to make sure they're good combat. 
After he was sure the major was out of earshot, Charlie approached the tent and cleared his throat. Colonel, do you think the major treats everyone he trains the same way that he treats us? He definitely has made a name for himself, hasn't he? Colonel Lewis laughed. And that's just how some men are, especially in the army. So maybe it doesn't matter to him that we're the first black squadron, but I'm sure it doesn't help matters any. Charlie nodded as the colonel continued, but listen, if we spend our time dwelling on all the doubts people have about us, there'd be no time left to fight this war. Let's let out our Let's let our flying speak for itself. Weeks later, when Charlie was beginning to wonder if they would ever get the chance to prove themselves, the squadron was called up for its first combat mission. Welcome to war, my brothers! Tex's voice boomed out over the squadron's radio system as they patrolled the skies over the Mediterranean and approached an island. Charlie's heart just hammered inside his chest as he maneuvered his P-40 plane past Smitty's and drove toward the island that was now in clear sight. He could see the barrels of anti-aircraft weapons pointed up in his direction from dozens of emplacements. As they started firing at him, he released a single 500-pound bomb from the belly of his plane. He saw the people on the ground scramble for cover. It was the first time Charlie had engaged his P-40's weaponry outside of training. He wasn't firing at practice targets anymore. Oops, that was really sad. So there they are up in there flying together. Throughout the next week, the squadron continued to run missions against the island. Day after day, the flyers escorted fighter groups and launched attacks against the enemy's gun positions. Man, at this point, Max's voice cracked through on the radio. I could run this route in my sleep. Me too, Smitty said. Heck, I was just asleep, Tex chimed in. But now that I'm awake, why don't I liven things up a bit? I'm afraid to know what that means, Charlie said into his radio. Just as he saw Tex dive past him and flip his plane into a barrel roll. Tex was known for his daredevil antics. And even though Charlie couldn't deny that Tex had some pretty impressive tricks, he thought he knew better than to perform them in the middle of a mission. There's a time to play and a time not to. Tex, what are you doing? Now's not the time to show off, Charlie called over the radio. Oh, lighten up. Why can't I have a little fun? Charlie didn't have an answer for him. Sure, doing unnecessary barrel rolls on a mission could be dangerous and earn Tex some scolding from the higher-ups, but this patrol was pretty straightforward, and both the Major and the Colonel were back at base. Plus, no one was a better pilot than Tex. Charlie began to consider that maybe he was too uptight sometimes. When the other guys fooled around and poked fun at each other, he was usually the one to set them straight, or at least he tried to. The mood of this mission was fairly relaxed, though, so how could some fun hurt? Just as he decided to loosen up and give Tex a break, he heard a loud roar break through the clouds ahead of them. So here's Tex flying off from the group, doing a barrel roll, but suddenly he hears, Charlie hears a loud boom. Is that what I think it is? asked Mac. Are those? Germans, Smitty cried. Charlie held his breath as he watched Texas plane tumbling right in front of an approaching ME-109. In all the times they had flown this same route over the past several days, not once had they encountered an enemy aircraft. But now, here there were four. Four ME's or ME-109s heading straight towards them. Charlie felt like he might pass out. But remembering his training, he gathered his focus and tightened his grip on the controls. Quickly, he veered to the right, pushed the throttle, and fired at the Germans. As his plane launched forward, he glanced down to see Tex right his plane and join in the attack. The Mi-109s weaved in and out, dodging their fire, and then, just as quickly as they had appeared, they shot up and flew out of range. When the squadron landed back at the base, 
the men exited their planes and walked back to their tent. Nice work up there, my friends, Tex said to the other three, shaking hands with each one. You're just lucky you didn't get yourself killed with that little show you put on for us, Smitty said. Yeah, yeah, I was in total control the whole time, nothing to worry about, Tex replied with an air of cockiness. But despite his words, the men all saw a look of fear dart across his face. Even the great Tex Douglas wasn't, at, wasn't immortal, and perhaps he was finally starting to learn that. The next day, the squadron raided the island again, but this time Tex maintained his focus and made sure to keep his plane upright. And though this mission was no different from the rest, the day became a historic one as the enemy forces on the island surrendered in defeat. Chapter 3, Sicily, Italy, June 1943. After a long day escorting bombers between Tunisia and Sicily, the squadron finally had a night off to spend in the city. As they strolled through the streets, they couldn't ignore the stares of the civilians who passed by them. Although the people of Italy had gotten used to seeing American soldiers and airmen coming and going in their midst, a group of black airmen was something they had never seen before. But the men kept walking along without hesitation. As they turned one corner, the door of a cafe swung open just in front of them. Whoa, look out, Tex said, rearing back from the door. Oh, excuse me, said a beautiful woman who passed by him. Tex's eyes lit up as he watched her. Certainly, signorina, he said with sincerity. The sound of soft music poured through the open door. Here, why don't we go inside? Listen to some music. Get a bite to eat, Smitty suggested. I'm in, Tex said. I think it's about time this town got a taste of Tex. He's a confident man. They found an empty booth in the corner. Charlie looked around and saw several groups of young women engaged in lively conversations with cups of cappuccino in front of them. Across the room, there was a large table of white American airmen. It was hard not to notice them, their loud voices booming throughout the cafe. Charlie noticed that many of the women at the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> at the tables closest to them kept looking over at the other airmen. He could only guess that each of them was chiming in about which young American was the best or had the nicest eyes or the brightest smile. At first, these other men didn't even notice that Charlie and his squad mates had come into the cafe. But suddenly, a deep voice echoed across the room. Look who's joined us, men. It's those colored airmen from the... The airmen hesitated. What do they call it? The elephant tusks? Tuskegee, one of his buddies offered. The two men approached the squadron's table, and Charlie could sense Tex since tensing up next to him in the booth. Oh, that's right, that's right, those Tuskegee Airmen. And as I see it, it's just kind of some failed military experiment. Do you think it's really right to call Tex and Charlie and Smitty and Mac a failed military experiment when they were just finding the Germans right alongside you? No, that was a very wrong thing to say. And before Charlie could stop him, Tex shot up from the booth and leaned in close to the airmen. Y'all wouldn't even be standing here right now if our raid didn't clear the way. We've got one of the best records in the force and that's no failure if you ask me. Well, nobody asked you, and frankly, nobody will ever care about your two cents, Sasquatch. He insulted him. And Charlie watched as Tex reared back to throw a punch at the airman. He quickly interceded, stepping between Tex and the airman. Listen, guys, we don't want any trouble. We just came in here to eat a decent meal and listen to some music. I'm sure you can understand. Sure, we understand. But we just hope you aren't the ones covering us up there because our mamas would like us home in one piece. Oh, so now he insulted him again, saying that their airman skills wouldn't be any good to protect them if they were in battle. Let's see what happens next. 
September 18, 1943. Dear Pa, I know I haven't written to you in a while, but we've been running five or six missions every day now for the past few weeks. And every day we knock down more and more of the German planes. We got three in one mission today. But we couldn't celebrate too long. Along with our victory today came a great tragedy. Two of our men crashed and one of them didn't make it. Every night I pray that I won't be the next guy they have to pull from the sea. I hope you know how much I miss you and mom and all the family back home. Give them all a kiss from me and let them know that I'll be home soon. Much love, Charlie. Chapter 4. The Ramatelli Airfield, Italy, June 1944. The entire squadron was gathered in the meeting tent awaiting a pre-mission briefing by Colonel Lewis. Before starting the briefing, the colonel took a moment to congratulate them for completing one year of combat missions. Congratulations, men, he said, addressing the squadron. One year of combat missions under your belt, and today's mission will bring us up to 500 total. I don't think anyone would dare question our abilities now. No, sir, the men called out in a rally cry. But now we're in the big leagues. We're flying into German land and it's going to be tight up there. Very little room to maneuver and absolutely no room for mistakes. Once the briefing was over, the men gathered their gear and headed out to the airfield. Like soldiers at attention, their P-47s stood in two parallel lines waiting for them. Each plane's tail glistened with the signature red paint the Tuskegee squadrons used to identify themselves. As they waited, Charlie knew they were all thinking the same thing. Their goal was no longer just to protect the bombers and get them to and from their targets safely. Now they would have to engage the enemy more aggressively. Charlie climbed into his plane and secured his seatbelt and oxygen mask. All around him, he could see pilots climbing into their P-47s. He recognized most of them from training in Tuskegee but there had to be at least a hundred men flying this mission. There was a lot riding on it, and he took pride in the fact that their squadron had been chosen. He looked over at Tex in the plane beside him and at Smitty and Mac across the field. He gave them a good luck thumbs up, which meant, which the men all acknowledged and returned, and then he started his engine and took off for battle. The squadron flew north and met with the formation of B-24 bombers it would be escorting to Munich. As the airmen flew towards their target, the weather became increasingly miserable and low clouds ahead of them reduced visibility. Charlie passed through a dense cloud and could barely see anything. He knew that he shouldn't break from the formation, but if he didn't find clearer skies, he might crash into a fighter ahead of him. He tilted his plane upward and rose to a higher altitude, and that's when he spotted a swarm of German fighter planes spread across the horizon. They were just in the cloud coverage above them. All my military guys out there. Me, ME 109's at 12 o'clock. Too many to count, but at least a hundred, Charlie reported. Let's get these Nazis, Tex called out over the radio. Charlie directed the squadron to split the formation and approach the Germans from the east and west. He turned his plane and then listened as the others followed behind him. Suddenly, the front line of Germans launched forward and initiated the attack. Charlie dodged their fire and unloaded his artillery in response. He weaved to the right and dove down beneath the ME 109s to approach from below. He cheered to himself as two of the fighters filled with smoke and tumbled towards the ground. Nice work, Ace, Tex called over the radio. The squadron pushed through the sea of ME 109s and continued to take fire. Charlie cringed as he watched man after man get hit and resort to aborting his smoking plane. Charlie's plane lurched to one side from the shock of a P-47 exploding on his right. As he rolled to the left, Charlie felt a pang of sadness when he realized that the pilot who was flying that plane was probably someone with whom he had joked and trained. Gritting his teeth, he completed the maneuver and righted his plane. 
He spotted an ME-109 approaching from his right, but just as he was about to alter a course to engage the German plane, it erupted into a brilliant explosion. You owe me one, Charlie boy, joked text over the radio. Charlie zipped through the smoke of the destroyed plane and moved on to engage other enemy aircraft. Charlie grinned and was about to thank Tex when he noticed a large black cloud of smoke billowing before him. His eye caught the number painted on the fuselage and he cried out in horror. It was McCleary's plane. Mac, Mac, do you read me? Charlie barked into the receiver. An eternity passed before a weak reply crackled through his radio. Yeah, Lieutenant, I hear you, but I'm in bad shape, sir. I've been hit. Left engines out, I think. There's a few holes in the cockpit. Then Charlie heard Smitty chime in. Smitty wasn't going to let Mac give up. Listen, Mac, Smitty said. The only bad shape there is is dead, and you're not going to be that. Do you hear me? I hear you, Smitty, but there, there's a lot of blood. And Mac's voice trailed off. Charlie watched as Mac's plane tilted forward and started to roll out of control. Can you see that? Mac, Mac, Charlie hollered, hit your controls, pull up, pull up. And somehow Charlie's cries jolted Mac back to consciousness and he blindly grabbed at his controls and righted the plane. I'm gonna stay right here with you and we're going to land as one, Charlie promised him flanking his plane on the left side. So that means he flew in right beside him on his left flank and he flew in with him to help him land. I'm right here with you too, buddy, said Smitty as he pulled up behind Mac's right wing. So now they're each on both sides of him. Okay, was all Mac could manage to get out. Charlie and Smitty talked Mac through every motion and guided him toward the runway. It was an ugly landing, but it was a landing nonetheless and the medical unit rushed over to pull Mac out of the cockpit. Mac was rushed to the hospital on the base. Charlie overheard the medic say something about lacerations and that he'd been shot in the shoulder, but everyone was relieved when they were told that Mac was gonna make it. Later, after the whole squadron had returned to the airfield, the men were given the night off from duty. Charlie, Smitty, and Tex headed out to enjoy the time off. They sat in a club drinking cappuccinos and telling their own version of the day's events, very aware that they had almost lost one of their friends. They spent the time somberly enjoying each other's company. As they were about to leave and return to base, they saw an airman approaching them from a table near the door. They recognized him as the same airman who had confronted them in Sicily. Remember the guy who was rude? Sorry, man. Not this time. Tex put out his hand to stop him from walking any closer. Look, we've had a rough day, and we don't need you to make it any worse. Please hear me out, he said, touching Tex's hand and turning it into a handshake. I just want to apologize for my behavior in Sicily. My unit and I owe you guys our thanks for that last mission. We wouldn't have made it out without you, he said with a broad smile. Thanks to you, my mama is going to get me back in one piece. You guys, you red tail angels, you really saved us up there. Charlie reached out his hand and saluted him. It was our pleasure, Captain. Up there in the clouds, the only thing that really matters is how well you can fly. Oh, yay. There they are, shaking hands. I'm glad that the pilot from Sicily came around. It's sad that it takes a difficult situation to make someone realize the value of another person. There's so many lessons we could talk about in this book, and I can't wait till we're together. There are a few words that I might not have pronounced correctly, and we'll look at those in the glossary too. Some of the places and some of the types of planes. So if any of you are a, a professional 
or knowledge about the different World War II planes, um, you can tell me and I'll look it up too. So everyone should be able to get this YouTube link to our book. So here's your story to use this week. Talk to you later. Bye.